It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Ray Priest, who will be talking to us today about launching disputes, and he's uh, willing to dispute with us. Absolutely. And uh, many thanks for coming all the way from uh, Fortaleza. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, Ray Priest used to be living in three different places in the world uh, at, the at the same time. <laughs> at the same time. And, and not. <laughs> and um, he just told me that now he's in New York, but not in the other two places any longer. So he decided to use this disjunctive syllogism and eliminate other options. <laughs> and I thought this disjunctive syllogism didn't work, but it does. Uh, but we will discuss about this. Uh, many thanks everybody for coming, and uh, let us enjoy the talk by Gray Thank you, Ben. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. I've never been to that part before, uh, and uh, it's really nice here. It's really beautiful. I love the climate. It's like North and Australia. I feel very happy. Um, so, uh, I'm going to talk about logic. And um, if, if you've been around in philosophy or logic for the last 30 years, you will know that there have been disputes between logicians. So, still the dominant view of logic is so-called classical logic. It's not a good name. I mean, it's an invention of the end of the 19th century. That's it's that recent, okay? But it's the orthodox theory of our day. If you go do a course on Logic 100, you'll be taught classical logic. But logicians have many stripes in the last 30 years have said, well, it's not the right logic, okay? Whether you're intuitionist or realm logician or paracon system logician, and logicians have been arguing amongst themselves about uh, whether, whether or not which of these logics is right. Okay. So, um, I want to think about what's involved in disputes here. Okay? Because when logicians argue about which is the right logic, what are they actually doing? How do you, what do you do to, to choose the right logic? Um, what does it mean? What is the methodology? Um, I mean, if you're a classical logician, you might think, well, you can't possibly choose a logic because classical logic is right, God-given, end of story. Okay. That's crazy. Okay? Um, so, I want to think about how we actually choose the right logic. And what I do is give you um, a, a model for theory of choice. So, I'm going to tell you that essentially choosing a logic is choosing theory, and then I'm going to talk about uh, the correct criteria for theory choice in this context. So that's, uh, that's the first half of the talk. And the second half of the talk, I'll talk about some problems you might have. Um, because the account that I will give you has no role for something that many people have thought to be essential to logic. And this is the a priori, or at least one particular concept of the a priori, something like Kant's. Um, so, in the second part of the talk, we will uh, look at some of the, uh, the problems connected with this. And I have to tell you that they're not real problems. Uh, so I'll speak about maybe 45, 50 minutes, unless you interrupt, uh, and then we can discuss. But please feel free to interrupt. Uh, and we can discuss as we go along, if you wish. That's perfectly fine. Um, if it looks like the discussion is getting too involved, I might say, well, let's carry this on in the discussion period, but please feel free to interrupt at any stage. So, um, let, me, let me just say how, uh, what I mean by logic. Because the word logic is kind of ambiguous, right? Um, for example, think of the word dynamics. The word dynamics is ambiguous. Dynamics can mean a theory, as when we speak of Newtonian dynamics. Or it can mean actual motion. For example, when we speak of the dynamics of the Earth, we're not talking about theory, we're talking about how the Earth actually moves. So there's a difference between theory and its object. And people use the word logic ambiguously for both theory and object. And I'm concerned with theory. All right? uh, so when we are choosing a correct logic, we are choosing a correct theory. A set of rational beliefs about what follows from what. Um, and I'll make another distinction to get this out of the way. There is an important distinction between pure logics and applied logics. Um, 
let me give you an analogy with uh, geometry. So it's kind of obvious there. There are many pure geometries. There's Euclidean geometry, parabolic geometry, hyperbolic geometry, and so on. And as pieces of pure mathematics, they're all equally good. Okay? There's no sense that you choose between them. You can study any of them. They're all good bits of pure mathematics. However, um, you apply geometries for certain purposes. Um, and uh, in particular, there's a kind of canonical application of geometry. It's what it was invented for, namely to chart the geochronology of the Earth, of the cosmos. Um, and for a long time, people didn't really make this distinction between the pure geometry and its application, its main application. But since Kant, we have learned to make this, this distinction. And now we think that Euclidean geometry is not the correct geometry for the space and time of the cosmos. It's something else. So it's the same in logic. There are many pure logics. You know, there's classical logic, intuitionist logic, many character system logics, and they all have equally good pure mathematics. They have model theories, proof theories, algebraicizations, and as a piece of pure mathematics, they're all equally good. Okay. But just like geometry, logic has a kind of canonical application, has many applications. One particular application is, in, is central. It's what, it was, it's what logic as the theory was invented to do, namely to chart the norms of correct deductive reasoning. Okay? Um, so when you apply a piece of pure mathematics to give you a canonical application, it gives you essentially a theory of how you should reason. And uh, then there is a choice of which theory is right. Okay? So as a piece of pure mathematics, there's nothing to choose between logics. It's when you say, hey, this logic gives you a correct account of the norms of deductive reasoning. And now I say, no, 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 this is how logic does. Then there's a dispute. This is the kind of dispute that I'm interested in. Okay? So when you get this kind of dispute, how do you decide? All right, so um, that's the introduction. So what I'm going to do is tell you what I think the answer is. So I'm going to explain how I think rational choice works in this situation. Um, and then I'll make some comments on the model to sort of flesh it out a bit so that some of implications more obvious. So um, let, let's start with rational theory choice. As I've already said, when you choose a pure logic and say, well, this is the right logic for canonical application, namely charting the norms of reasoning, essentially we're constructing a theory. Just as the people who constructed uh, or said, hey, Riemannian geometry is the right description of the geometry of the cosmos, they had a theory about the way the cosmos works. So when you apply a pure logic, essentially you've got a theory about the norms of reasoning. So how do you choose the right theory? Well, I reckon the answer doesn't really depend on the content. We choose theories all the time. We choose theories in physics, we choose theories in metaphysics, we choose theories in morality, and we choose theories in logic. Um, and philosophers of science have thought about this quite a lot. And over the years, I found there's, there's a kind of consensus on the methodology for the right theory choice in physics and the natural sciences. And I'll describe it for you in a minute. And I reckon pretty much that, that account of theory choice, rational theory choice, works across the board. So what, what is the account? Well, first of all, you have to remember that when you choose a theory, there are many features which make something a good theory, and conversely, many things which make something a bad theory. So, um, there are many criteria such that if the theory passes them, it's a good theory. The most obvious is adequacy of the data. I mean, that's why you want the theory in the first place. You want to get an account of something, right? So that's important, but it's not the only one. So, these other virtues love to keep in the play. Uh, simplicity, consistency, power, avoidance of ad hoc elements, so they're all things kind of standard things. 
So these are good making features. And the bad making features are, are when you know, a theory is added to the data, it's complex, maybe it's inconsistent, it doesn't have much power, it's got lots of attack elements. So violation of these criteria um, will give you a, a black mark in theory choice. Now, it, the world would be nice if all these criteria always pulled in the same direction. Pull in the same direction. <laughs> all right. They don't. Okay? Sometimes a criteria will pull one way, and sometimes it will pull the other way. All right. So, I mean, look, here's a story about the history of astronomy. It's standard history. In the, where are we, 16th, 17th century, people are worried about how the Earth and the Sun move, or whether the Earth and the Sun move. And there were two theories. There was Ptolemaic astronomy, and there was Copernican astronomy. And um, both theories were pretty much um, adequate to the data. They both gave much the same sort of, uh, both had much the same empirical predictions. Um, so they're about equal on this. All right. However, the standard story is that the Copernican theory was simpler. And it wasn't simpler because it, it used epicycles, just like Ptolemy, but it didn't use the equant. Okay? If you don't know what those mean, it doesn't matter. Okay? Copernican theory was generally reckoned to be theoretically simpler. However, it had a big problem because it could not account for the motion of the Earth. So Ptolemaic astronomy was consistent with the dynamics of the day. Right? So um, Copernican theory was not. Either it had no explanation of how the Earth could move, so it failed in the condition of power, or you could hand it at best in ad hoc measures. Okay? So you had two theories, they're both equal in accuracy to data, simplicity pulled one way, and the of ad hoc elements pulled the other way. And it wasn't really until the uh, 17th century, when the new dynamics evolved, that uh, there was enough unanimity of criteria to make it possible to make a rational choice. Okay, so what it illustrates is that the criteria do not always pull in the same way. Now, given that, when is it rational to prefer one theory over another? Well, the obvious answer is that one theory is better than another <coughs> if it performs sufficiently well on sufficiently many of the criteria. Now that's vague, okay? And probably it's all going to be vague. But you can type it up to a certain extent. So let, let me give you a formal model and uh, make the idea I've just said more precise. So um, you're going to have a number of criteria, C1 through Cn. And uh, we need a scale to measure how good something is according to each criterion. Um, and so the measuring scale is kind of arbitrary. But let's just suppose it's uh, some uh, integer between plus 10 and minus 10. And so each criterion, C, is going to have a corresponding measure function such that mu of C, the measure function applied to the theory, is going to tell you how good the theory is. So it's going to give you a number between plus 10 and minus 10. All right. Now, that will tell you how good each theory is according to each criterion, but not all criteria are equally important. Adequacy of the data is clearly the most important criteria. So we need to weight the criteria. So we need to assign them values as well. Um, again, it's kind of uh, arbitrary to a certain extent, but let's suppose the weights come from the same range. So now we have a measure of how important each weight is, and we have an account of um, how well each theory scores under each criteria, and we can simply take the weighted average. So, um, given a theory T, I'm going to call the rationality index of T just the weighted sum of how the theory performs on each of the criteria. So it's the sum of the products of the weight times how well that theory performs on the criteria. That gives you an overall measure of how good the theory is. And uh, at any time, we're going to be choosing for a bunch of theories. They can change as we go along. 
But at any time, we have a bunch of theories to choose between. And uh, one theory is rationally preferable to another, just if it has a higher rationality index. A way of making precise what I said just now. One theory is better than another if it performs sufficiently well on sufficiently many criteria. Well, that's a precise rendering of it. Um, if there's a tie, you know, if two theories are equally good, well, maybe you can go either way, maybe you should suspend judgment, it doesn't really matter for today's purpose. Um, but the important point is that uh, this gives you uh, a way of rationally choosing which is the best theory if one is really the best. Um, and I think this model of theory choice works across the board. Okay? It, there may be little differences depending on whether it's an empirical theory or a metaphysical theory or whatever, but essentially the picture is the same. Uh, and I reckon this picture works in logic. So when you know, I argue with my classical friends about which logic is right, we don't actually sit down and do the computations. Like, no one does that, right? It's kind of crazy. But if you look at the way that debates are constructed, if you just go and read the journals and see how people argue, what they're actually doing is saying, hey, my theory is better than yours on one of these criteria. My theory is simpler than yours. Or, hey, my theory accounts for the data better than yours. So these are the criteria which actually get addressed in live debates. And so this isn't, you know, people don't sit down and do the calculations, but um, this is something like a rational reconstruction of what's going on when people do argue about which theory is the right theory. All right, so that, that's the basic account of rational theory choice. Um, any questions or comments before I carry on? Yes. yes. Uh, how can you compare if you have a theory that's a um, scientific theory and another one that's a uh, theological theory? Oh, I don't think you can. I think the theories have to work the same way. I mean, uh, try to explain the same problem, but using these completely different vocabularies. <coughs> one is oh, that, that's fine. Accept the supernatural and the other one uh, says it doesn't, and well, it's really because of that. Yeah, but look, look <laughs> um, in real life debate, say between uh, evolutionists and creationists, okay, um, they, they, they maybe can account for the same data, maybe, okay? But if you look at the creationist explanation, they haven't, that every time something happens, they say, well, because God did it. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's really ad hoc. Okay. Um, so, you know, even if you can wring out the same kind of consequences from creationism, you know, this is going to fail badly. So, you know, that doesn't tell you whether you should believe in God or not, but it does tell you, tell you that creationism is not a very good theory of how we have to get to it. But you, you would use the criteria of uh, yes, yes. rationality in this is a comparison to students. Yes, yes, numbers, yes. Numbers. And that's what I think we do. Right. When I meet sort of North Americans who, who tell me that how great creationism is, this is what we argue about. Right? Um, so, and this, is, and this is exactly how the debate between creationists and um, evolutionists goes in the United States. I mean, I don't know whether it's a debate in this country, is it? It's not to be. Is it? <laughs> Right. Well, in Australia, if you're a creationist, people think you're crazy. And you probably are. <laughs> but North America is different. Strange country. Evolution seems to be taking us that way. <laughs> Here, right? Right. Is that right? Okay. Well, fight. I don't think it's right. <laughs> yeah. Please. Well, I have a similar question. It seems to me that uh, in the ancient world, among uh, technical specialists, uh, the question of the uh, uh, geocentric theory over heliocentric theory was decided for theological reasons. The same kind of theological reasons that were working in the 16th and 17th century. And so what you do is you get a spillover from other concerns which aren't really proper to the scientific field in question. And so this raises the question about, you seem to be assuming that the uh, scientific literature, their discussion, uh, is rational. It's rational and it follows your, uh, the model that you put forward here. I would say, to the extent that it is rational, it would follow the model you're putting forward here, but historically, it's just not rational. Well, I, um, the, the particular case you have in mind, we'd have to look, look at the details, okay? 
Um, because uh, originally the debate was decided long time before Christianity. You know, there were heliocentric theories around long time before Christianity, and it was decided in favor of yes. So, um, I'd rather not get engaged in sort of debates about history of astronomy because they're kind of tangential to where we're going today. Well, my point is that the, you're assuming that the, uh, the actual debates are rational. Oh, no, I'm not. That's the main point. I don't think people always behave rationally. Okay, of course they don't. The creationists, I don't think, are rational. I'm telling you what is to be rational. I don't think that means that everybody hates rationally. So then you can't base your, uh, you can't say my model is a, is a good model because uh, it reflects what people are actually doing in the discussion. Because Correct. the discussions aren't rational. Correct. Okay, okay the norms Fine. of rationality. I, not exactly that. They're, they're norms. They're what people ought to do. They're not what people do to it. Okay. Yeah. Even if people are rational, uh, they have to agree on the coefficients. This is true. This is true. They are not likely to, to do that, even for a, a given application. Okay. So, um, th this model is simplistic in many ways. Suppose there's an exact model, which is the way it's just crazy. Okay? Um, but what you can hope for, I think, is that there's a range where people agree roughly that it's that actually that is very important. I think everyone's going to agree on that, so they'd have to score that high. Simplicity, most people think is highly important. So even though you can't get an agreement on precise numbers, I think probably you can get an agreement on um, an appropriate range, which would be sufficient to determine the problem. Is that okay? Thank you. Generally, uh, people try to, to, to attribute more relevance to things that are uh, that favor their theory or. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, so there was also a special pleading, okay? So, you know, um, when people debated Newtonian mechanics versus relativistic mechanics, people put the best case they could, and the scientific community sat back and they judged. So, people have special. Have, have, people have. Um, in English, barrows they want to push, but the decision is made by the community, okay, which like, factors out individual biases. Yes, uh, just want to go one step further. Uh, if you're trying to make a rational choice, uh, that seems to be based on some underlying logic. So they're Good. giving an, uh, an underlying logic a certain priority. Good, you are ahead of me. <laughs> hang, hang in there. Okay. We will get to that in the second half of the talk. Okay. okay. All right, let's go. Uh, let, let me just make a few comments on the model. I mean, some of his implications have already come out, which is great. Let me put a few more on the table. So, uh, okay, so let me make a few comments on the model. The first thing to note about the model is that it's fabulous. Okay. That is, we can get it wrong. I mean, how often have got it wrong? Um, because, for a start, the data is fallible. Okay, you might get the data wrong. You might say, well, what is the data? And I'll come back to that. Okay? Um, but uh, a good theory is supposed to account for the data, but it can actually show the data is wrong. Um, but the theories themselves might be wrong. So. Um, at any time, we choose from a bunch of theories, but no one's said we've got the best theory yet, okay? People are free to uh, determine the, another theory which might be better. So it's entirely possible that someone will come along with a better theory at some stage. So our best theory now might not be the best theory in 20 years or 100 years or 1,000 years' time because we might have a better theory or we might have new information which shows that one of the other theories is better. So how good a theory is, how rational it is to accept it, can change over time. Okay? In that sense, rational belief is fallible. Um, let me make one more comment about these criteria. We've talked a bit about the ways. Um, but the criteria I've given are um, kind of I'm not hanging my hat on these criteria. They're the kinds of things that 
methodologists in the philosophy of science say that we do. But, you know, maybe you have to look more carefully at them. I don't really mind. Um, simplicity, for example, can be said in many ways. And it may well be that the criteria of simplicity actually fragments into several different criteria. If it's like that, so be it. But all these criteria come by the words. All of them. Uh, even this one. Okay? Because consistency comes by the grace. Now, if I was secretary in North America, there'd be a howl from the audience at this point, and I'm in an enlightened country, so I don't need to <laughs> emphasize it. But of course, if you use a logic that doesn't mark that I have a question concerning this. Sorry? That you mark that I have a question concerning the second round. Alright, okay. Well, let me just that finish my with the mind. Abuse of North America. America. Um, so, I mean, if you have a logic which says that a contradiction implies everything, then you, you only have two positions, consistent or completely inconsistent, right? So it's an all or nothing matter. But once you move to a power consistent logic, consistency itself comes by the groups. And hey, we're talking about theory choice here, right? So, the theory choice of logic. So power consistent logics are on the table here. Okay. So I reckon even this uh, criterion comes by degrees. Yes? Well, my concern is I can express it now and then you can come back to it. You can come back. Because your, your bigger aim here is to talk about logical disputes, right? Now there is in a sense in which the, the your preferred logic, the logic of paradox, be the problem comprehension principles. We have theorems which are sort of self-disputing. It is an inconsistent logic, right? It's, or it's an inconsistent system. And, and then so you will have theorems to perform the liar sentences true. And you will have theorems to perform the liar sentences not true. And then of course this concerns the consistency. But my question is somewhat different, and it is that of the following nature. And it is that it is unclear to me what you want theorems to, to be. There is a long tradition like the Fay, right, that logic is concerned with truths. In the Griffschlicht, I think it begins with talking about this. And then all theorems are, so to speak, denoting truths, according to the picture of faith. They are referring to truths. Now, in your logical paradox, the picture is, of course, uh, different. Nevertheless, it is a feature of the semantics that these two sentences denote the same thing. And so my my concern is, okay. how is it that you think that these sentences contradict themselves? Three things. I'm not here today to defend paraconsistent logic. No? Okay? All I'm doing is talking about the methodology of how we choose. It's another topic for another day to compare particular logics on these criteria. Happy to argue about that in the pub, all right? Okay. But I don't want to get into it now. <laughs> yeah. The second thing is, all I was doing was pointing out the consistency comes by degrees, and you haven't disputed that. The third thing was uh, a very general point about what we're doing when we're constructing logical theories. Now this is important. I'm going to talk about that, but let me come to it now since you've raised the question. Um, you cannot identify a logic with its set of logical theorems or logical truths. That is because there are different logics which have the same set of logical truths, like classical logic and LP. Logic is an account of a consequence relation. What follows from what? And when we construct a logic, what we're doing is constructing a theory of a consequence relation. What follows from what? And not only what follows from what, but why? Because when we construct a theory in logic, we don't just give a washing list of what's valid and what isn't. We're supposed to explain why. And if you explain why something is valid or invalid, then you have to bring in things like truth, meaning, probability, and then of course all our old friends like negation and the conditional. So this is a big ask, okay? Theories of validity are hard. 
Um, I don't know, actually think now we've got one that's really adequate. But you know, we know what some are like. So I mean, here are some from history. Okay? First of all, there's Aristotelian logic, augmented by the medieval theory of truth conditions, which is what they call supposition. Um, there's classical logic, that is Frege logic, augmented by Tarski and model theory. There is intuitionistic logic, supported by some kind of inferentialist account. Um, so those are three things from the history of logic which come immediately to mind. And as I said, I'm not here today to tell you that any one of these is right. I'm just pointing out that when we theorize, we're theorizing about how and why a consequence relation behaves, and that is going to be hard because it's going to bring in so many other things. So that, I think, addresses the substantial part of the You're looking at the best thing that I'm right, satisfied with your answer. No, I'm not satisfied. It's certainly a bit of concerns concerning okay. you so, so, what um, all right, so, I'm so, not sure so, if I should... Um, okay, so at this point, let, let's carry on with the debate, give a discussion. Okay. But, but, but certainly, this issue is it's very central to, to your main concerns. Well, of course, I mean, so I, I've spent the last 30 years arguing with this and this is an attempt to think through the methodology of what I've been doing, what they've been doing. One comment I could make is that what, what I have come to think, and just as information, how I think of my logic is that you may think of it as simply a function from real numbers to real numbers. That's Even a coding. That's a bit of pure mathematics. That's a bit of pure mathematics. Yes, pure mathematics is not in dispute. It's yes, when you it's when you're fine. So it's when the classical mathematician says, okay, it's not the case that it's not the case there's an infinity of prime numbers, so there's an infinity of prime numbers. And the intuition yeah. says, no, that doesn't follow. What are they debating? They're debating whether this is a correct inference to make. That's what's the issue. How do you resolve that kind of issue? Well, I, I was just uh, just uh, giving up on your reduction of logic and logic to a consequence relation. But this, this consequence relation might itself be thought of as a function from three months to three months. Of course. Of course. I mean, so, so it, it, it is, if you like. Yeah. But then one's asking about which function is right and why. Yeah, yeah. That's the point. OK, so let's carry this on in the discussion here. Um, so when you get to Okay, so I gave some comments on the model. Um, I was going to talk a bit about logic as theory, but a lot of that I've said already in answer to the last question. So, um, let me just make one more comment. Uh, logical theories have changed over the course of history. And all you've got to do is open textbooks from the last two and a half thousand years to see that. Okay? So, if you open Aristotle's Analytics, if you open Paul de Venice's Logical Magna, if you open the Port Royal Logical La Pensée, if you open um, Hilbert and uh, Bernays Grunagen, okay, you will see that they give very different accounts. Um, so theories, we know that theories can change, but we know that theories have changed. Uh, and the only bit of history that most logicians know about this is the move from kind of traditional 19th century logic to uh, classical logic. Why did that happen? Well, okay, this is a whole other story. Because um, I haven't told you what the data is yet. But roughly speaking, the answer is this. Um, a lot of new data became available at the end of the 19th century when mathematicians turned their lens on how logic is actually used in mathematics. So they said, hey, look, we reason like this in mathematics. And there's no way you can account for that in traditional logic. Here's a logic that does better. So classical logic soon became entrenched precisely because it was much better at accounting for the data than traditional logic. Um, but of course, once it became entrenched, it became kind of um, a bit of orthodoxy, and orthodoxy is always dangerous because there have been non-classical logics around, well, since, you know, 1910, 
think of in Mathematica, but no one paid them serious attention because everyone thought, oh, no, classic logic is what you write. Um, you cannot say that now just because in the last 15 years we've seen non classic logics articulated to the point where there are serious competitors to classical logic. Um, but there's still an enormous amount of problems in the subject. So, again, not in an enlightened country like Brazil, I'm sure. <laughs> but you'd be amazed how many people in the US say, uh, change of logic, change of subject, end of story. Uh, yeah, the Quinean dogma. Um, it's, a, it's a terrible argument, okay? But this is what people think of. They think, you yeah, know, we've got it right. How come people think that? Well, it's the power of the logic textbook, okay? You look at any Logic 100 textbook, and it says, this is what logic is. No conception that logic is a theory. No conception that this theory was produced at a certain time. No conception that uh, our theories have changed over time. I mean, the logic I'm looking at is a branch of philosophy. And that's a bunch of other things too. But, look, none of us would go into a, a philosophy of mind class and say, well, this is functionalism, that's true. Just get used to it. But a lot of students in Logic 100 are told exactly that. You know, they go to Logic 100 class and the rest says, oh, look, contradicts they apply everything. And people say, that's crazy. And the teachers say, well, yeah, now just, just get used to the ones and zeros and they come out believing. So at the end of the semester, people come out believing, right? Because they weren't given any alternatives to choose from. Um, so, oh, sorry. I've sidetracked because it's a comment on the sociology of our profession, which is not really what I want to talk about. <laughs> However, it's, it's kind of interesting. All right. Um, okay, so uh, I, I should say something about logic and evidence because I, I've sort of referred to that already. But in, in the empirical sciences, it's, it's quite clear what evidence is, right? We do an experiment, we get data, that counts our evidence. What counts as our evidence in logic? Well, the data is essentially the theory, the, the, the data of inference that we have. Okay, so I, I talked about the fact that at the end of the 19th century, lots of new data became available in this regard because of our investigation of the way that mathematics actually reasons. But let me give you a few simple examples. So, look. Johnny's in Rome, so Johnny's in Rome is Italy, so Johnny's in Italy. Most people think, yeah, that's okay, right? That's a bit of data that we've got to account for. Or, John's in either Rome or Florence. If John's in Rome, he's in Italy, he's in Florence, in Italy, so John's in Italy. That's, that's okay, right? So, that's a bit of data we've got to account for. Well, what about these things? John is either in Rome or Florence, so John is in Rome. Uh, okay, that's not good. So if, if theory tells me that's valid, that's black mark, okay? Or if John's in Rome, he's in Italy, John's not in Rome, so he's not in Italy. Now, despite what your beginning logic students will tell you, <laughs> this is not very good, okay? Um, so th these are the kind of data that we have to work with. Um, prima facie, some inferences are valid and some not, and we want to account for this data in the best way we can. Now, as I've emphasized, the data is fallible, okay? And a good theory can overturn uh, aberrant data. It's better if you overturn, when you overturn data if you explain why the data's wrong. If you just say, oh, the data's wrong, not very impressive. But if you can say the data's wrong, and I'll tell you why, that's more impressive. So, look at this inference. Mary's taller than John, John is taller than Betty, so Mary's, Mary's taller than Betty. Is that valid? Well, you ask most people, they say, yeah, sure, yeah, that follows. But of course, you know, according to modern logic of any kind, that's not valid. So it appears valid, but it isn't, right? So this is kind of, you know, not a good piece of data for modern logic. But modern logicians have a story to tell about this. They say, yeah, look, this, this inference isn't valid, but, you know, there's a suppressed premise. Maybe that four people x, y, and z, if x for the y and y is for the z, then x is for the z. And if you add in this extra premise, then it's valid. And 
this extra premise is so obvious that we forget to mention it. So we're inclined to think this inference is valid, but in fact it isn't. And when we think the inference is valid, we're actually confusing it with the n line mean. Um, now, I'm not saying this is right, but what I'm just doing is illustrating for you how you have a piece of data which your theory overturns, especially if you've got a good explanation of why the theory doesn't work. Okay, so that's the end of the first half of the talk. Let me pause for one second to see if there are any more questions. I have a short question. Uh, could be the case if there is two incompatible theories, and how could we decide if they are incompatible using the model? Um, by incompatible, you mean incommensurable? Um, I mean incompatible models mean you can't have both, but that's that's what you have in theory choice. So I guess by incompatible, you mean incommensurable. You just can't not on the same scale. Yeah. Um, no, I don't, on this model you can't have incompatible theories because you've got the, any two theories are going to uh, pull up on the same scale. Uh, I mean, if you're comparing a theory of moral philosophy with a theory of logic, those are going to be incommensurable because if you're, com you're, not, you're not comparing the same thing. But if they're both theories about logic, they're going to be commensurable. What type of data is coming? The arguments or the things about the arguments? The data are the intuitions we have about the validity of arguments or the invalidity of arguments, I should say. And it's soft, but you know, what, what are we doing when we construct a logic? We're trying to account for that sort of data. Because in science, related to the other question, the, the different theorists see the data differently, so they can disagree about the, the same data, the way to interpret the data. The data. Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly the data in empirical science is different from the data in logic, because it's, you get it empirically. Um, and so there's always going to be an issue about the reliability of your, of your measuring devices and so on. That's, that's true. That's not an issue that arises here. Um, I think there are analogous problems, but uh, if I get to those, I'll take a little bit of tangent. But the prima facie, at least, some issues are going to arise in the group sites which don't arise here. That's, that's right. But I mean, it doesn't affect the basic structure of the model. Back to a question that was asked before. Um, it seems to take us to dispute about what the, what's the underlying argument. Or, or else uh, we could have this problem of having the same piece of argument which is interpreted in a different way. The intuitionist wouldn't read not not the way as the classical intuition does. Will that come soon? Well, to okay. Okay. So those are two, two distinct issues. Okay. We will get to the first one, I promise. Um, in, in the second one, um, I think the data is common. Here's a bit of, here's an inference which we make, and we, 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 we catch the inference in English or Portuguese or whatever. You know, mathematicians don't work in a formal language, they work in a natural language. So they make inferences in a natural language. And so this inference, you know, there's not, there's not the case, there's not the case there's an infinity of primes, so there's infinity of primes. That's what was one of the things that intuitionists and classical traditions disagree about. Um, and what they may well be disagreeing about is the semantics of negation. That's fine, because when you articulate a mathematical, uh, sort of logical theory, one thing you may be having to argue about is meaning. Okay? And so, certainly that's on the table, but I don't think that means the data varies. Um, okay. So, we must make sure to get around to your question. Uh, okay, so... Um, 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 um. Okay, let, let me start by putting something on the table, which may be obvious, but uh, it may not be, so let me bring it out. 
Um, in some ways, the model that I just described is kind of similar to Klein's theory, um, which you've only done uh, two dollars, um, about uh, beliefs being revisable. So our beliefs form a kind of connected network, and when we get new data at the edge, we revise our beliefs, and then they can be revised. So this is the two dollars model, right? Um, now, it's not exactly the same as that. Um, because the periphery is playing no particular role in the story. Okay? Um, when we revise a logical theory, it's usually not because of observations. Um, and moreover, revision doesn't have to be taken, it doesn't have to take place because of new data. It can happen because of a new theory, and that's something that Quant doesn't think about. Um, and moreover, when Quine says, well, we revise our theory, it doesn't tell you how you do this. This tells you how you do it. Okay? Uh, so there are differences between a Quinean account and the methodology I've just described. However, there is one way in which they're very similar. The way they're similar is that your theories, your logical theories, are situated. Now, um, if you look at some traditional accounts of deductive logic, say Aristotle or Kant, um, there's a kind of foundation. <coughs> so a priori intuition or something like that provides the foundation on which all other knowledge is built. So the, build, the building blocks are not revisable. Whereas in Quine's account and my account, everything is revisable. So, you are not a tabula rasa, um, a, a, a blank um, board. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you're a cat, you sort of sit there and think, okay, now I'm going to enter my mind and just think about my uh, structure, my intuitions, and um, now I'm going to tell you, given that my structure intuitions are like this, what's about it? Okay? It doesn't work like that. Um, why do you believe the things that you believe about logic? Well, because you were taught them, right? You were taught them either by your mother, who said, no, you don't refer like that, because if you refer like that, you're going to fall under a bus. Or, you know, you study logic and your teacher tells you. You don't get a choice about this. Most of the things we believe, we don't believe because we choose to believe. We believe because we're taught them. Okay. So you do not start from nowhere. You start from what you're taught. And uh, the only thing you've got a choice about is how to revise your beliefs. Okay. So, um, knowledge is situated in this way. You cannot get something from nothing. Uh, you start with what you're given by your education, by your culture, by your society, and then you revise. So, there's a nice um, motto, um, analogy, metaphor, I don't know it, called the ship of not yet. Um, which says, hey, you know, you can't logic, when our theories like logic, are like boats. Um, you can't sort of construct them in a dry dock because we're in the middle of them, we're out on the sea. So you can't take the theory apart and rebuild it. You can change it plank by plank, but you've got to start from the ship you're at. Okay. Uh, so um, this is what I mean when I say logic is situated. You have to start from where you are, what's given to you by your culture, by your education, and then you get the chance to revise, and hopefully revise rationally. All right, now, that's a picture of logic, and it's not the traditional picture, as I said, because um, the traditional picture is some kind of logical Euclidianism. So this is a quote from Christian Wright. At the foundations of logic are certain, immediately obvious, Certain a prior truths that constitute our basic logical propositional knowledge. Think of Kant. Um, now, the Kant the account I've just described gives no role for this kind of a prior knowledge. So you may well think something's missing. So let me give you two things you might think would be missing that you need to appeal to the a prior. And one of them is if you're question. So um, the phenomenology of the obvious. 
people say, well, hey, you know, you can theorize about logic, but when it comes down to it, some things are bloody obvious. How come they're bloody obvious, you know, if it's a matter of theorization? Sort of logic. Because it's a priori, you know, it's Kantian. Um, well, look, the first thing to note is that um, obviousness is a psychological issue. It's not an elitic issue. The question is, why do you find certain things obvious? Now, everybody has to explain that, even if you're a cancer. How do Kantians explain this? Well, you know, I've just told you roughly, you know, Kant said um, the inferences are given to us by the forms of the categories. Uh, and how do we know the forms of the categories? Well, they're kind of implicit in the structure of thought. They're in our own mind, as it were. And we have, you know, immediate access to our own mind. That's how we know what's valid. Well, you know, this is a crappy explanation, right? Um, because we don't have immediate access to our own minds. That's one thing we've learned from modern psychology, right? All sorts of things are going on in the mind you don't know anything about. You know, ask Freud, ask a modern kind of scientist. Um, so this, this is not a great explanation. Um, however, you know, I will leave to people who believe in their prior rights to tell their own story. Um, the question is, can I explain it? All right. So the next thing to note is that lots of things people think are obvious. So when Galileo said the earth moves, people thought that he was obviously wrong. Because well, it's not a matter of logic, it's a matter of physics, okay? Why? Well, because we do feel the earth move sometimes. Are we in an earthquake zone? So you have earthquakes here? No? No. Okay. Well, a bit of Australia are earthquakes. <laughs> And if you've been in an earthquake, you know what it feels like for the earth to move, right? Um, and it's the, what Galileo was proposing was nothing like that. So people say, yeah, we know what it's like for the earth to move. Uh, and it doesn't. You're obviously wrong, Galileo. Um, so, yeah, people thought something was obvious, and it, it wasn't. Uh, how about this one? We hold these truths to be self evident that all men are critical, that they're endowed by their creator. And with certain unalienable rights, that among these life are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Anyone who gets knows the answer when it comes up gets a beer. <laughs> Anyone know? Uh, well, you certainly know. Jefferson. It's, it's the Declaration of Independence, the American Declaration of Independence from Great Britain. Um, uh, these things are evident, right? Well, maybe. So these guys, you know, the, the, the founding fathers, not the founding fathers, the, what do you call them, the people who signed the Declaration of Independence, um, certainly seems more obvious. Um, it just kind of shows you that what's obvious is different for different people, and moreover, what's obvious to some people is just is false. Um, so how come these people thought these things were obvious? Well, the answer is, that these people were operating with some kind of internalized theory, according to folk theory, if you like. So when the people told Galileo that the Earth that obviously doesn't move, they had a kind of um, a folk theory of what motion is. And according to that theory, it was wrong. And uh, their folk theory was made things kind of obvious. Or well, that these guys. Okay? Um, they internalized this actually a locking theory of natural rights. Um, so these things have then become obvious to them. But if you have the internalized locking theory of natural rights, these things are by no means obvious. So, okay, so let's now come back to logic. Why do people find certain inferences, like universal instantiation or modus ponens, obvious? Well, it's because they've got a folk theory of logic. So, you know, just as people have a folk theory of motion, which they acquire as they grow up, so people have a folk theory of logic, which they acquire as they grow up. And uh, if you've internalized a certain theory about validity, some things will seem obvious. So, that, I think, is the explanation, okay? 
we don't have to explain uh, why these things are true. That's another matter. We have to explain why they're obvious. And the explanation that I think is most plausible is that when you find these things obvious, it's because you've internalized a certain folk theory. All right. Logic and circularity. I did promise you that. So, as we saw, we'll um, We're in the business of choosing a logic. And it would seem that reasoning is involved in the process. So how can you be choosing a logic when logic is involved in the very process of reasoning? Okay. Somehow, you know, logic must sit above this process. That's, that's the thought. And of course, if you believe in the tradition a priori, you say, well, what is, you know, the logic is above because it's a priori, so we don't have to theorize about it. It's just sort of given to us by the light of natural reason. All right, so this, this is a, a real objection. Um, but it pays to be clear how much logic is actually involved in the process. So just think about how much logic you would have to use to go through the decision problem, to go through the computation of something's rationality index. Primitive occurs Primitive occurs <laughs> Okay? You've got to be able to multiply, add up, choose the maximum. Um, you may also need to be able to sort of say this is an application of modus ponens. It's all primitive recursive arithmetic. So that's pretty minimal. Right? Now, most disputes among logicians do not dispute anything like arithmetic, especially not primitive recursive arithmetic. I mean, that's common ground to you know, even intuitionist mathematicians, constructivist mathematicians, computational mathematicians. So, this is not as serious a worry as it might appear at first, because most real life disputes between logicians use a very, very minimal amount of logic. Having said that, then in principle, it could arise that the dispute involved primitive recursive arithmetic. Okay. So the dispute could be about the canons of inference involved in doing the computations themselves. All right. So what happens in that situation? Well. We are not tabulae rasa, okay? You start from where you are. That's all you can do. You go from what's given to you. So, if we are using a bit of logic that's involved in the computation process, we use the bit of logic we've got. We, we use primitive recursive arithmetic. Uh, and um, that's all you can do. Now, it could be that after you've gone through the computation process, you revise this. Okay. Well, if that does happen, you have to redo the computations. Okay. Could it happen that you then get a different result? Well, maybe. I mean, it's a priori possible, I guess. So you might do it again. And, you know, maybe there's no stability. Maybe, you know, a, 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 Particularly worst case scenario is when you flip flop backwards and forwards. So you use this logic and it tells you that that logic is better, and then you use that logic and it tells you this logic is better. That's that'd be pretty horrible, right? Um, what would what do you do if you're in that situation? Well, I don't know the answer um, because, as far as I can see, it's never happened in the history of science or the history of logic. Um, presumably. You would try, I mean, it's, it, something's going wrong, that's clear. Okay? Presumably, what you would do is try to construct a theory which doesn't suffer from the same problem. How do you do that? Well, that's a question for theory construction, not theory choice. Okay? It's the, it's the uh, domain of um, uh, creation, not the domain of rational choice. Um, so, the, the, the answer to your question, I think, is that in 
in real disputes, the sort of worry that you raise doesn't normally happen. And if it really did rise, I think we would have to think very seriously about the methods because we'd have to do some more things. Um, but I'm not trying to give you, even the methodology I'm giving you is not a priori. I'm not doing Aristotle or account on you. I'm giving you something like the way I reckon that methodology works amongst kind of rational choosers now. And maybe that can change too. And maybe when you fell on the rise, you'd have to change the methodology. Everything's fine, as I said. Um, so uh, it could well be that something would happen which would cause you to revise the methodology. How do you revise it? Well, essentially the same way, okay, by like applying this kind of uh, way to some maximization. Um, but as I say, I, um, I don't know any case in the history of science or the history of logic where this is actually a reason. All right, I reckon I've been talking far too long. Um, let me just conclude. Um, I've been talking about rational choice of our theory of logic. I've said nothing about what makes a theory true. All I've talked about is what makes it rational to believe it. What makes a theory of logic true is a quite different question. Uh, and it's a much harder question. Um, so what I want to point out is that I haven't been addressing the question of why theory and logic is true. That's another topic. I've also not addressed the issue of um, why are the sort of standard criteria are good making criteria. So what is simplicity of virtue? Why is ad hocness a negative virtue? Now these are, these are hard questions. And they're the sorts of things that philosophers of science argue about. Um, and I don't know the answer to those. Uh, I don't know that anybody else has a particular answer either. Um, but I, it would be nice to have an answer. Um, and what I, think, or what I suspect is that whether you choose between physics or logic, um, it's not going to affect that question, right? Simplicity is going to be a virtue, if it's a virtue for some reason which works equally well on whatever you're theorizing. So uh, I haven't talked about that question either. So I just wanted to end pointing out the things I haven't tried to solve. All I've tried to do is give you an account of what's going on when logicians argue about which logic is right and um, give you a sort of a simple model for rational theory choice in this area and try to show you that it's, uh, it's a plausible theory of how we choose logics. Thank you. Logicism died 90 years ago. Say again? Logicism died 90 years ago. Sure, sure, sure. But, 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 uh, but the project of uh, finding a kind of foundation in, in, in logic has continued up to No, no, no. Yes, no, no. Yes, no, no. The, the, the foundation is in mathematics. It's not logic. Certainly, the foundation is in set theory or category theory. It's not logic. No, what? what? What I would add is yeah. that they have the logic plus something more. Like the ZFEs, the NFEs, and all these people have logic at bottom, and then that some, some, some more things. 
So, and, 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 and that is not logic. logic. That is what I think of as a foundation of this uh, point of view. And this is this is what I want. I don't I don't I believe don't, in that picture. Okay. I, I, I don't subscribe to it. Well, that was just. Well, we don't, we're, not, just, we're not disagreeing. Well, it might be that they have a level of overlapping agreement, but certainly in... in, in, in we both well, we, we we agree that you cannot yeah. have mathematics and logic. Mm. Not, uh, not, uh, anyway, that, that okay, so we still have a few disagreements. Uh, it's not about that, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, when you... When you speak about uh, in, uh, the, uh, the the lack of, uh, and I, I, I arrived a little late, I, I didn't catch up with the, with the beginning of the, the talk, but you said the model you presented uh, does not allow for uh, incommensurable uh, views of, of, of logic. And uh, I believe it's, uh, it, 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 uh, when, when you say, for instance, that uh, we, we begin to think about logic or think logically at all uh, from a definite perspective, inherited perspective within a, 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 that is embedded in a culture and the practice of a society, etc. Uh, but uh, it is a fact that uh, the very conception of logic uh, changed a lot uh, through history. And so uh, you may say that uh, uh, the uh, Aristotelian view of logic, for instance, uh, is in a sense uh, an equivocal concept uh, when you compare it to uh, uh, contemporary views uh, based in mathematical logic, for instance. I believe, I think. Because uh, um, uh, uh, when, you, when you say that uh, there is a, 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 a kind of circularity problem uh, surrounding this uh, discussion of, uh, of the choice of a, a, a logical theory, uh, because in principle we, we would have to, to, to rely on logic, to think about logic at all, or, or, and, and of theory choosing, etc. Uh, but uh, the truth is there is, there is a lot of, uh, of things that go before logic. There is a book by uh, Richard Mason, if you, if you know, know it, that, that is called Before Logic. I'm oh, sorry, I don't know. Uh, and he he uh, he refers, for instance, a, a lot to Heidegger's uh, uh, the metaphysical foundation of logic, and uh, and he 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 uh, uh, he states some things like uh, the very the very concept of. Uh, uh, possibility and necessity there is embed that, that is embedded in, 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 in uh, uh, contemporary uh, talks of logic, even in, in the definition of logical consequence. Uh, it was, uh, uh, in a way, uh, uh, dependent on uh, a, a choice by Leibniz uh, in, in that. Uh, uh, place that put uh, sentences of what we talk or, or, or judgment propositions as the, the locus of necessity. So, so we say of, we, we speak of necessary truths rather than of uh, some things necessarily uh, belonging to a, 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 to a being, for instance. So this is a, 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 a debt we owe to, to, to Leibniz, but, but Leibniz himself was uh, thinking about some theological problems and he, he, he indeed uh, chose uh, this way of dealing with, with necessity because of the, the 
urgency of, of what he thought, he, he thought to be uh, the theological problems of freedom and contingency, etc. Uh, so, uh, uh, it is difficult to, 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 to talk about uh, uh, talk about uh, 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 a choice of logic that doesn't allow for uh, uh, incommensurable rationalities in a sense. Okay, but you have raised many different issues there. Okay, um, let me just make a couple of comments. Um, theories of logic have changed remarkably in the West in two and a half thousand years. Okay, no doubt about that. That does not mean that uh, these theories are incommensurable. It just means they're different. And I'm going to talk about how you measure them. Okay? Incommensurability is when you do theology and, I don't know, physics. Those are incommensurable. So they're embedded in, in, uh, 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 in uh, wider conceptions of rationality that give, give them a sense, you know. Okay, look. Yes, that's obviously true in one sense. Um, I don't know quite what you mean by wide conceptions of rationality. However, um, one thing you talked about is the metaphysical kind of opinion of logic. Metaphysical kind of opinion. You talk about Heidegger, you talk about Leibniz. You don't have to go there to see that. You look at Aristotle. Okay? Even Aristotle said that future contingents are neither true nor false. He had a certain picture about the metaphysics of the future. Okay? So even for Aristotle, metaphysics is involved in logic. And that was just an easy example. So I, I told you that constructing a theory of validity is hard because you have to take into a number of different take into account a number of different things. And some of those may well be metaphysical. But the common core is always this. When logicians dispute, they're disputing about what is the correct consequence relation when we argue. But what we're disagreeing about is what follows from what. And that's been the core of logical disputes ever since you know, the debates in ancient Greece. Um, we have a few people before, so you know, just a minor point about the circularity. Uh, when you get into the details of your model, you have to make choices. And, and these choices uh, about parallel experiences. And these choices uh, may be disputable. For instance, you raise the point of consistency. Uh, of, of course, I don't, I, I, don't, I don't expect you to miss the opportunity of, of mentioning paraconsistency even if it's not central. But at, at that point, if you, when you get into the details, you have to choose whether to use classical consistency or not. And in other parameters, you have to, to make choices. This, these choices will be disputable. So you will need a, a model to evaluate it. And uh, some will claim that uh, uh, classical consistency is simpler. And then you may say, no, but uh, but consistency will be more fit to the blah, 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 blah. So you need something to evaluate that. But then you will need something to evaluate your own model. And then you may... So, how, how do, how so do you look, you're raising that? two issues, and they're distinct. Um, the first one is simply about the choice of logic. Okay? Should you use... Uh, you suppose you're choosing between a character system logic and um, a, uh, an explosive logic, then... Um, or any other parameter. Well, no, this, we haven't got to the parameters yet. We just choosing between logics with different features. In one contradiction exposed and one they don't. And how to measure cheapness. Okay. So let's get the easy question off the table. First, okay. we may be choosing between the explosive logic and non-explosive logic. That fits happily into methodology. Alright? What may dispute what may be a dispute sometimes, I think it probably is, is the weight of the criteria. We may dispute these. And I think what's happened actually in the last 30 years is we've seen a debate of that kind. Um, because um, consistency has traditionally been taken to be a completely damning black mark. And what paraconsistent logicians say is it may be a black mark, but it's defeasible. It can be trumped by other virtues. So this is a this is an issue about uh, the criteria themselves. So how do you resolve the debate about criteria? Well, um, 
what you do is you go to the next meta level and, and, and then you take consist you take the criterion off the table because that would beg the question. Um, and then you form um, two rival hypotheses. Consistency is an absolute black mark, consistency is not an absolute black mark. So you've got two theoretical positions and then you argue about those. And then you apply the methodology you've got to yourself. Well, except you've taken consistency off the table because you don't want you don't, you don't to, don't want to beg any questions. But essentially, you apply the same methodology precisely because the methodology is a general method for theory choice. No, and, and the point is just that you have to, uh, in make, you, you have to make some choices, and then if you want to evaluate your choices, you would have to use a model of blame it itself. Of course. It, it's just to make a, a point about the circularity inherent to... Well, not, no, what you're, what you're pointing to is not circularity. It's a point that then, when people choose between logics, there may be meta-issues involved. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll give you another one. Um, there's a debate between logical monists and logical pluralists. And it may all be thought that the account I've given privileges logical monism. So I told you how to choose the right logic. Okay? But it doesn't. Because um, if you're a logical pluralist, or at least a logical pluralist of a certain kind, you're going to say different accounts of validity are appropriate for different areas. How do you know what account of validity is appropriate for that area? You use the methodology. So, what is the debate between monists and pluralists? Well, it's a debate, it's a meta-debate about um, whether a single account or a plurality account is better. And this is a theoretical debate. Um, how do you decide the debate? Well, you know, it's a meta-debate, but essentially you apply the same methodology. So again, there are meta-debates in the area as well. Thank you. Probably uh, a naive question. Uh, do we need a uh, criteria for uh, choice between different systems of logic? Uh, or maybe uh, these systems can be considered in some way complementary so that they can serve to different purposes, they can uh, be more or less adequate to different uh, circumstances and so uh, this problem would not be uh, so, so look you're raising two distinct issues here let's keep them apart the first is that um, when you apply logic you apply for a certain purpose okay um, and you have to fix the purpose before you choose the logic, otherwise you don't know what you're doing. And of course it could be that for different purposes, different logics are appropriate. So for example, if you want to simplify electronic circuits, then you use Boolean logic. No one disputes that. If you're doing something else, like um, trying to figure out how to reason, then you can use another logic. So that, that's, that's not um, no contentious. But the second way you might interpret your question is this. Um, could you have different logics which are adequate for all different purposes in the sense they're both about reasoning, but one thing is about reasoning about, say, the mathematical <coughs> objects, one thing is for reasoning about subatomic objects. Now, that's exactly the question of logical pluralism, which I was talking about just now. Um, and depending on how that debate gets resolved, the answer may be yeah. So, you know. Maybe you should use classical logic for medium-sized dry goods, quantum logic for quantum states. That's that's possible, but that's perfectly consistent with what I said. Uh, I'd like to know if you have thoughts about uh, the possibility of uh, relation along the criteria. Uh, for instance, if you have uh, a simple theory, it can be more powerful or less powerful. So I'd like to know if there is some correlation yeah. along those criteria, uh, what's the, the consequences Good. to your model? Alright, look, um, the way I set things up, it looks as though the criteria are independent. In fact, they're not. Um, let me give you a very simple example. Um, take the criteria of consistency. Now, suppose you've got a trivial theory. 
Well, that's certainly going to score bad. The true theory is one where everything follows. Right? It might be true in physics, it might be logic, it might be metaphysics. Um, that's going to score really badly on the criterion of consistency. But it's also going to score really badly on the criteria of um, adequacy to the data. Because it's going to tell you, hey, it's okay to infer that uh, Jan was a frog. Uh, which is bad news, both logically and physically. That arrow has to be. So we can't get one. I'm free. Shut up. Excuse me, I've already done. Okay, so, so, uh, so a high degree of inconsistency is going to interfere with how well something performs on another criteria, adequacy for data. And it doesn't have to be a trivial theory, it can just be a very inconsistent theory, same problem. So, I mean, you're right to point out that the criteria are not all independent. Um, I don't think that makes a difference to the model. Um, then the, the sum would need to use some linear algebra. Because they're not, not orthogonal directions. They're not orthogonal, but nothing the model assumes they are. So look, there, there might be an issue here that I haven't seen, but I, I don't see it at the moment. Yeah. Uh, I think some of the reactions about the, our just theory of choice it's because it's a good theory and well-known theory applied to science, to, to scientific theories. But uh, I think there is a fundamental difference between a scientific theory and a logical theory, or a logic. And when we talk about to, to solve the debates, the disputes uh, about logic, I think, what would cause these this disputes? Why do two rational people would disagree about what follows from what. And when I uh, think about that, and I think about the, the, the folk logic we, we have, the things we are learning, uh, I think this, the, these things we, we learn in this uh, uh, folk logic, we all that knows to speak, uh, know a little and use it, it's related to, to a folk way to, to see the world, the, the things around us behave uh, according to this logic. And we start to look to things uh, differently, more sharply, or in, in, a, in a less uh, uh, intuitive and, uh, way. We start to disagree about uh, what, are, uh, what is the world, what is the metaphysics, what's, what the reason, the reason to the way things behave. And then we uh, uh, may disagree uh, about uh, uh, logic. So, uh, and this kind of, of disagreement, I don't think we will we'll find a, a, a rational and indisputable way to, to resolve. There will always uh, have disagreement like there are, there will always have disagreement about metaphysical theories or ethical theories. How do you choose about? Uh, I used to, to teach my, my students that uh, if we, we have an abstract uh, principle. It doesn't matter if it's a logical principle, an ethical principle, a metaphysical principle. How do we think about it? What do we do? We apply it to the world and see its consequences and to see if I agree with that principle or, or not. So uh, we do it uh, with logic, but we, we are uh, knowing uh, through science and through our uh, our uh, understanding, we are knowing better the world than we knew before. So we disagree about Okay, that. look, you, you've raised several different points again. The first point was that logic is not the same as physics or, or science, and then you said that's because we have these five theories, okay? This is not a difference. <clears throat> if you look at the debates about motion in the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries, People disputed Aristotelian mechanics versus some, some other kind of mechanics, you know, the, the Oxford calculators. So, you know, Aristotle had a folk theory, the Oxford calculators had a different theory. They're, I mean, you can have folk theories in physics, just you can have folk theories in logic. Now, that was one issue. The second issue was um, you may not be able to choose. Well, now that depends what you mean. You can't be sure you get it right. That's fallibilism. I'll give you that, okay? Does it mean that we can't reach consensus? No, it does not. How do I know? Well, because if you look at the history of logic, consensus has been reached many times. 
this is blown apart again many times, but we have reached consensus, as we have in physics many times, and it's blown apart. So um, I, I don't see that there's any principal difference. Um, you, you can find consensus in logic, you can find them in physics, but of course they can blow apart. That's both subjects and both the fallible. I see no new hands raising, so old hands raising, and I've uh, been here for an hour and a half, and so I would propose people to take the discussion to the pub and continue after we thank the speaker again for all this beautiful talk. Thank you very much.